Thank you so much for that, guys. Um, I wanted to ask a question first, just to get the ball rolling. Um, in all the poems, uh, many of the poems we spoke about tonight, and specifically in the piece from Little Gidding, there's a, these poems center on a confrontation with a stranger or another voice. Um, and what I, the argument that's kind of going on in my head that I would like you to comment on is, is this, is this really, is these poets' imaginations, is Eliot's imagination here really encountering another voice? Is it really a stranger? Or are these imaginations more projections and ventriloquies um, of really the, 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 the poet speaking to themselves in a way? Um, and what does that mean of hospitality? This is, this is um, <laughs> well, it says, although we were not, partly because it's like a dream, mm -hmm. isn't it? And in dream, you do have familiar compound ghosts, isn't it? Right? Right. Somebody simultaneously, my mother and John Silver. Sure. I mean, it's kind of rather wonderful <laughs> combination. Um, <laughs> yeah, when, really, it should be my father and John Silver. Um, so you... So you um, yeah, so, so the, the dreamlike world makes sense of all of that, mm -hmm. and we all experience it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it won't do simply to say projections, mm -hmm. though, uh, because that, make, that means there's only one person involved, all right. Mm -hmm. um, Eliot is not, like some great poets, uh, remarkable for imagining whole other states of consciousness than his own. Mm -hmm. uh, nor I think is Beckett. I think I take a very very. I don't think Beckett's genius is like Dickens's. Dickens really imagines mm -hmm. people uh, whose connection with Dickens is immensely remote mm -hmm. uh, and surprising. Um, but uh, so I mean, mm -hmm. I, th I think the passage is very intricate, isn't it? About although we're, we were not partly because there was only one of us, partly because um, I heard another. I spoke and heard another's voice cry. Uh, that's got an odd relation, as a friend of mine has pointed out, to dentistry. Uh, this happens to be at a time when Eliot had had terrible trouble with his teeth, as I have recently. Um, and you know how you, you don't sound like yourself. Uh, I shall not proceed to take my teeth out now and sound very different to you. Uh, but, I mean, it is a very, very strange thing, that. I mean, that is, the, if you think about the ear, you know, yes. the cave of the mouth and the shell of the ear and so on, it's all forming part of it. So I think what I want is not to have too clear a notion of the other with a capital O. Bad things started happening when others started being spelt with a capital O. Did you not, did you not find on a uh, vicious circle? But please, the poor. Well, that's, that's, it's, yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, you're right. Some people are better ventriloquists than others, and you've mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned Dickens. Uh, many novelists are, are able to actually create uh, figures that you can believe in who are not the self. Um, w with the poets that we're discussing here, uh, it seems seems to me that what we have is is a project is a projection largely of the self. Uh, you know the other person. You may have known the other person for years, but how? You know, but then you have to imagine they're speaking. Uh, what do they say? I mean, uh, that Baudelaire, for example, did Baudelaire say that? I don't remember his lips even moving. Mm -hmm. So where did it come from? Did it come, in other words, that in the hypnotic state or the uh, trance-like? Was this? Was I finally touching on what what mattered? Now I'm going to use a word here. Uh, in some ways, it's for me, it's kind of when prayer when prayer that is meditation works at its deepest level. Um, there's a, there seems to be a, a level where you know where, where, where there's no where you have to be serious because there's no one else listening. You know you're only going to BS yourself at that at that point. You know so you listen and you try to respond at some deeper level uh, and it may it may take a, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of silence. You can't have an iPod in your ear or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You really have to have silence and then. Either the silence is a void, and I, I don't believe that, I, I, because then the silence becomes pregnant and begins to speak to you um, with a self or a sense of oneself that you, that you normally never use. For example, you meet, Elliot meets somebody on the street. How do you do? Oh, I'm fine. How, you know, how's your mother? How's your father? But this is a familiar compound ghost. This is quite different. This is, uh, this is, another, this is the other but it's also the self. I mean, if it's Yeats, for example, I mean, it's many people. I know Baudelaire, it's, you know. But yeah. if it's Yeats, for example, this, this, you know, Yeats had died in, you know, in January 39, and, and there had been a real difference in terms of, you know, uh, the, the dialogue between you know, Eliot as a believing Anglo-Catholic and Yeats 
moving more towards, you know, the Steinach uh, monkey gland operations and Eros, et cetera, you know what I mean, uh, to revivify his glands, et cetera, you know, his, you know, this is what was going, you know, crazy Jane poems that you get at the end. And Eliot sees this perhaps as a mistake, but now that there's been a refining fire, maybe now Yeats sees more clearly. You know what I mean? Now that he's gone, he's been where Eliot will someday, be, you know, hope, hopefully be a per, at least a purgatorio. So um, that's, how do you get outside of your own head? You know, how can you really speak, no matter how many words you use, they have to come out of here, finally. Now you can be a very good ventriloquist, but, it, but still you have to put the syntax together, the sentence together. I don't know how else you can escape that. Do you have any questions from our participants? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, fascinating, both of you, uh, wonderfully Thank you. presented. And when you just mentioned uh, the question about the familiarity versus and hospitality, in both of your readings, your interpretation of, of Eliot and your poll of poetry, it's haunting and disconnected and terrifying at the same time. The key word, I think, is his choice, uh, uh, Eliot's choice of the Latini, because he says, tu se qui, tu, which is a familiar form. Mm -hmm. So we're speaking about strangers, mm -hmm. but his choice of Latin and use of two, which is the, the mm -hmm. informal, the, mm -hmm. the, um, that form, mm -hmm. to use with his maestro, his, his teacher, his, gets rid of all the uh, unfamiliarity. Mm -hmm. And now we're in this world right. that I think you're talking about when you get to the meditation and prayer, or, and you're talking about Paul and Louis. Unfamiliar, very familiar, and I think that's fabulous the way you're able to balance in your presentation of, of Eliot and Pound and that kind of the tension, I think, uh, is just wonderfully done, and I think it does speak to the hospitality and hostility that we sense that maybe they are inextricably linked in some way, that the familiar must come with that which is foreign or strange or terrible. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like you both to speak on that, please. Christopher, say something? Uh, okay, you want to say first? Okay, all right, Christopher. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I've been thinking a great deal, uh, you know, about about the the nature of, the, of this gathering. You know, it's been it's been wonderful. Uh, uh, I've been thinking of things like, uh, how do you meet the enemy? Uh, you know, uh, I think of Walt Whitman, for example, in the, during the Civil War, um, as a nurse, male nurse, you know, on the, on the battlefields uh, in Fredericksburg and elsewhere. Then in you know Washington D.C. Um, the enemy, a Confederate. Okay, they call them Confederates, but it's a, it's it's a man from say uh, Virginia. You know, uh, it's a man from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, and and then and it's a human being. And uh, so there's you know, in one sense we call them the other, but as soon as you have a, a contact with them, as soon as you have to touch them, as soon as you have to bandage them, they're others. You know, they're, they're ourselves really. You feel you feel that pain. It's. Um, uh, the thing about about this, uh, you know, the uh, what the newspapers do, the pirates. I was just thinking. Suppose I was held at gunpoint, you know, by those by, by those pirates. Um, you know, what would I mean? It, would there be any attempted? Con of course, I'd be terrified of you know an AK-47 in my throat. Yeah, but at the same time, who are you? Do you want to take? Do you want to take my life? And of course, then if you can negotiate, you know, if there can be time, uh, you begin to feel the kinship with the other. You know, what, what seems so strange gets less and less strange very, very quickly. Uh, you become brothers, mon frere, you know. Uh, that, I mean, that's my, that's my sense. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that I couldn't be popped off before I had a chance to make, make, that, <laughs> make that connection. But if there's time, I want to know the other. There's no one that I've ever really met that I, you know, don't want to know if, 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 I, if, if I'm given a chance back. And some of them are enemies, you know what I mean? I know they're enemies. I, in the in, in, in it's it, the worst moments, I want to kill them, if you will, or, or I want to write something so devastating that <laughs> that is like it's like a murder. And then I catch myself on this, and I say, "What am I doing? What am I doing?" And then I say, How, "Wouldn't it be interesting if they just we just had a chance to negotiate this? We could be friends." I mean, isn't this what happens with many uh, uh, poems about soldiers, for example, from Thomas Hardy and Wilfred Owen and others, Rosenberg and others, where if they just had a chance, that you know, it, it could open up into another into another sphere. I I I, I differ. <laughs> yes, uh, I. Okay. Uh, that is, I mean, I think the danger here is of 
I don't think you are a sentimental person. I think the woman in your poem is quite right to say you're a good man. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, the, the danger in uh, there is a yeah. danger yes. here of exaggerating yeah. the uh, of ignoring the limits yeah. of the sympathetic right. imagination. Right. That is, the sympathetic imagination has limits, and although it is part of the purpose of art, I take it to try to have those limits not be as narrow as they usually are. The idea that in if you think yeah. of an Anthony Hecht poem like More mm. Light, More Light. The idea is yeah. that in some way or other, if we could get through to those people, I don't, don't everybody remembers the, 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 the terrifying oh, yeah. story of that poem. Uh, that is, uh, yeah. you, uh, the Pole uh, refuses to bury alive the Jews. The Jews are then uh, released from it, and the Pole is put, in, put into the ground that, uh, that they have vacated, and they do not refuse. Uh, much casual death had drained away their souls. Yeah. It, it's, a one, it's a wonderful poem. Yeah. It's in no way an anti-Semitic poem, but it's also in yeah. no way a philo-Semitic poem, uh, because it understands that in these circumstances, and then, of course, the pole is up to his head being buried alive, yeah. and then he is taken out of it, and he is told now to shoot them. And he does it. Mm. I, I may have got the story. He is told to bury them alive. He buries them alive. He is himself shot in the stomach. Yes. It takes several hours for him to die. So yeah. I'm misrepresenting them. Now, I think that's a poem about the, you know, about the limits. That yeah. is, it's not the case that if one had time enough, one would negotiate <laughs> with these particular people. They are not negotiable <laughs> with, uh, unlike Cuba. <laughs> uh, uh, or or you, you, choose, you, know, you choose your play. I mean, there's a real question about you know the point at which. The yeah. So I, I think I, I, yes. I think there's something a bit ho there's something a touch hopeful about yes. this. Yeah. Um, the world is darker than that, and there are real questions of justice. I mean, that is Anthony Hecht. If I stay with him for a moment, because I've been thinking about it, Hecht is right to be very concerned. If it really is the case that the only evidence that we have that Brunetta uh, Latini. Uh, was a sodomite is Dante's word for it then there's a real problem do you know I mean? that is how do we all know Brunetto Latini is in, is in hell as a sodomite we know it from Dante if it really is the case as the scholars say that we don't know it from anywhere else then there is a real problem about allocations mm. uh, now why does it matter that he's a sodomite it matters because it is a perversion of the teaching relation that is a very important part of Eliot's uh, Brunetta Latini. Uh, Eliot's childlessness is never absent from his work. It's it never. Uh, any more than um, Charlotte Bronte's is, or any more than um, Samuel Beckett's is. That is, you know, and it's not just that works of art are surrogate children, though that, mm. that's a very honourable tradition, and it's not a tradition limited to women. I mean, feminist criticism tend to make out that women's writing is falsified because, you know, Jane Austen's books are third of her children, and she thought of them. Uh, George Eliot's books and so on. Actually, male right, men are repeatedly thinking in the similar terms. But what I'm getting at is that something, the Renato Latini thing is very, very strange because it makes the, the, the teacher student relation mm. uh, a really crucial one as a kind of fatherhood, do you know what I mean? And a fatherhood, the abuse of which is then like a terrible, in, like terrible gay incest. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have more to get at here? Mm. So that the, mm. the Hecht has a very good letter, a letter actually to, to, to Lewis, the Dante scholar, uh, saying, is it really the case then that Hecht allocates people, um, uh, everyone, that, that, uh, that Dante allocates people off his own bat? And won't there be a special circle in hell for people who presume to do that? Okay. Uh, that, that, that. Um, yeah. Do you see how I wanted to get at it? I think that the wish that this should be mm. the case, mm -hmm. uh, the mm. belief that it can yeah. at all often be the case. No, no. I, well, you know, man ran off with my wife. I would like to have killed him. I didn't want to get <laughs> together with Jeffrey and say, I understand your position. She's very attractive. And, I, and so on. No, I, I didn't feel that. I just wanted to kill him. Um, is that wrong? No. Not as bad as divorce. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I would... <laughs> <laughs> as a coder, as a I'm, I'm not going to. Can there be a coder to that? Get, you know, you just, get just, one, just this one episode, and so on. And you can go back to your your, your boring life. <laughs> just as a coder, uh, <laughs> I do agree with you. I, 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 I do agree with you. I mean, I would like it to be this way, but it, there are times, obviously, when it cannot be. Uh, and in fact, when I read Anthony Hicks' poem again, uh, 
you know, I, I really felt for the Pole. You know, yes, you know, don't kill these men, don't kill these. And then they've been so drained, you know, by, by you know, carrying bodies everywhere and burying that they'd simply do it. And, and then what do you do, you know? <laughs> I guess then I would bury them, you know. Uh, I guess I either. And then the weird, the irony is, of course, he's, the Nazi uh, 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 captain shoots him in the stomach anyway, yeah. and it takes him several hours to die. So there's no winners in this thing. No, no. What, uh, the thing is, I, I came I came away with Heck, because Heck had served in the war. He had been at one of the concentration camps, and I think in early '45, had seen this first firsthand, as a fir, I think as a, pr, a private first class. I think he was, and. And, and he was there. So I say to myself, okay, I'm imagining this, but I'm in a classroom here at Devlin, you know what I mean? Mm. What's, it's another thing to have a uniform on, you know, and to be out there and told, this is, if you want to live, this is what's going to happen. I don't have an answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. Richard. Yeah, uh, I have a question for each of you. Um, but before I pose it, uh, I would just like to restate that one of the main themes of this seminar is not just to celebrate hospitality, but also to examine as closely as we can hostility yes. and the very fine line between them. Right. So yeah. uh, I appreciate what you both said about the limits of the sympathetic imagination. My question to you, Christopher, is, um, I hope it's not too technical, but you mentioned foreigner at one point, and I, I wanted really to, to push that a little bit. What, what for you would be the difference between foreigner, the person who comes from a foreign land, as you put it, and the stranger mentioned in the penultimate line of the first um, the first column here, the first met stranger in the waning dusk, I call it the sudden look of some dead master. Is there a difference, do you think, between the foreigner, as you were describing it, and this kind of stranger, described by Eddie here? Well, I think, I mean, it's true that I then draw on all of it, and it's true that I've written a book about prejudice, and I think foreigners alien and prejudice, and that foreigners are a particular focus for prejudice. People who are quite confident that they're totally without prejudice about people with strange names or from foreign, it's not true. Mm. I mean, that is, fortunately, right. it's yeah. not incorrigible, but it needs to be couraged, and the idea that we naturally have it, you know, that we, we're good people, and we don't in any way take against, you know, oh, yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, that is, you, you know, the English accent in films now means that you're extremely sinister, sexually very strange. Uh, and not, I mean, that's what the English accent is. Uh, that's how it works in films. You're probably in the fine art world and kind of pretending to be gay. Uh, <laughs> and, and all that comes is this huge. And if you have, if you're a woman who is handsome to look at and blonde and slightly equine and from the south, you're stupid. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you just think of the yeah. film stereotypes depend mm. repeatedly on these things. And the trouble is that, of course, they only work because there's something to them. Mm. There's something to them. I mean, we all belong to a type, <coughs> and the type of the, of the cop that Rod Steiger plays in Heat of the Night exists. And if it didn't exist, we wouldn't have a whole series of often very damaging, but not always damaging, stereotypes. So you're back with some of those problems. But I think Elliot, from the beginning, is fascinated by the ways in which uh, he is... He's, he's a foreigner when he's in America because he's a European. He's a foreigner when he's in Europe because he's an American. He hankers, for, of course, for the time when England and Europe are indistinguishable because Catholic is universal. So as soon as you have to say Roman Catholic, or you remember the great C.S. Lewis moment when he says there is no neutral term. Uh, if you say Roman Catholic, it's invidious and unfair. If you say Catholic, it too much accedes to that point of view. So I shall, I shall adopt the neutral term papist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a terrific, terrific moment for Northern Ireland. To carry, to carry, to carry back in. So, but there isn't, a, there isn't a neutral thing to say. I mean, we, we don't have a... You know, people are, I mean, it comes up, doesn't it, with... It comes up with the colour of your skin. That is, you can put black into the plural and you can say whites and blacks, do you know what I mean? But you've got, there aren't browns. You've got, there isn't a plural noun that goes with the colour of your skin being neither white nor black, do you know what I mean? There isn't, there isn't a noun there. So that the language presents us with actually these insoluble. They're, they're simply insoluble. You can't call into existence a, a noun. Uh, but of course, the whites black thing does make for the assumption that the essential, key pro uh, the essential racial problems in this country are black and white. 
but if uh, but if you're Kingston, you don't believe the essential problems in this country. I mean, if, if you're if you are she, you believe that the prejudice against people with yellow skin is very very ancient and far more pernicious even than the legacy of the slave trade. Do you know I mean? think how well uh, Asian Americans have written about this? I mean, she among them, but Amy Tan do writing very well. About it. So what I'm getting at, so that I, so I think the foreign thing is 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 different. I mean, it does bring up, and a lot of his a lot of Eliot's most powerful and kind of awful puns depend on a love of the French and a revulsion from them. My mother was French, and my father had the love of and the revulsion from my mother quite promptly. Uh, I mean, there's very characteristic feelings, isn't it, about French? It's not, it wasn't just George Bush who wanted to abolish the word French and replace it with the word freedom uh, when it came to things to eat, isn't that right? I mean, you remember the freedom, freedom fries? fries. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Maybe after a bottle of freedom wine, I, I noticed, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if you, think of, if you think of those very shocking and brilliant and wonderful lines, I'm glad I never uh, came up with, and Eliot, of course, didn't publish them, odours confected by the cunning French disguised the good old hearty female stench. Mm. Now, yeah. those are astonishing lines to have written. Yeah. Uh, it is good, it's a good thing he never published them. Mm. They are wonderfully well written. And the pun on can, in punning, and uh, the, pun mm. in, the pun in can, <laughs> and the pun in uh, confected, Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, absolutely, it's yeah. kind of an amazing bit of international writing, and uh, do you know what I mean, but but full of kind of dislike and distrust of of thing, so but very honest. What's happening, Christopher? Just before I sorry, oh, yeah, I've no, 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 What do you think is happening with this capitalization of the O in other that you're um, warning us against in contemporary critical discourse? Philosophy, whatever. I mean, well, the word disco, you see, he says <laughs> disco, he said discourse. Oi, oi, oi. So you call it that. But, well, I, I have some very small children, and my bigger children, I remember one of the little children was reading Good, Good Night Moon, or was being read Good Night Moon, and David picks it up and says to the child who's one and a half or whatever, What's this? he says. And she says, Book. And he says, text. <laughs> <laughs> it's a text. It's, a text. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a sort of cant, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just everybody going around saying other as if that shows that they're a good man. Anyway, so please ask him. <laughs> yes. In your, in your opening wonderful protocol, uh, you rehearse these various uh, poets uh, that you encountered, in fact, or in imagination, uh, Heaney and Eliot and Hopkins and Yeats and so on. Was there any sense, as you are traversing their imaginations and their, their sense of strangeness and strangers, that you felt that one or some of these are stranger to you? I'm coming back to Ken. Mm. Christopher's point that it's hmm. that our natural inclination is to have sympathetic access to those who are like us. Yes. You know, mon semblable, mon frère. Yes, yes. It's similar. Right. It's familiar. Yes. It's a familiar ghost. But were you aware as you were writing this piece that there were some voices, poets out there that were actually quite alien to you? Hmm. I mean, poets you didn't like, but that, that you would like to, in some sense, encounter. Uh, and wrestle maybe hospitality from hostility, but that mm. your initial reaction would be allergic. You know, uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, the one that immediately comes to mind is my relationship to uh, W.B. Yeats. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> this has to do so with... Sort of betrayed in your line about monkey glands. And <laughs> 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 Just an old man, old man in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's, I mean, who, I, I've taught seminars on, on Yeats. Uh, uh, I've often coupled him with a, uh, uh, there's a bad word, <laughs> uh, but twinned him with uh, Seamus Heaney uh, to, to take a look at the 20th, cen you know, the 20th century in terms of Irish, Irish poetry. Um, <clears throat> there's something... If you're asking, like, would I feel uncomfortable sitting down and having a beer, you know, uh, I would probably feel uncomfortable having a whiskey or beer 
with Yates at first, because I think he'd be sizing me up. This is part, is, is part of this, and the same thing is true of Robert Lowell, by the way, um, which is why <clears throat> I found myself uh, uh, much attracted early, you know, over 10 years of my life to William Carlos Williams, because um, we shared so much, you know, uh, whereas with Lowell, uh, it took a long time. Uh, in fact, it was because he had converted to Catholicism in the 40s, uh, after having read Hopkins and after having read Dante, that as a young man looking for at least one Catholic intellectual in the whole shebang, uh, even though by the time I had come to Lowell, he'd already turned to Baudelaire, in a sense, you know, and, and life studies. But... <clears throat> um, when I was doing, uh, for example, when I was doing the interviews for the, uh, writing the biography of Robert Lowell, and I went to visit Elizabeth Hardwick on 67th mm. Street, and <clears throat> and I, I'm, uh, you know, uh, she w she's on West 67th Street, and I grew up on the East 51st Street. Now it's, you know, it's only t maybe 15 minutes, you know, to get to walk there, but it's it's it takes years to actually get there culturally, mm. and uh, and many, in fact, you. I probably will never get there. Um, I, I look at I look at Hardwick's own background, you know, coming out of Kentucky, for example, and to see how she remade herself with uh, the Partisan Review and Philip Robb and others. Okay, and I'm not willing to go there. That's just there's something in my roots that won't allow me. Like I feel closer to Seamus Heaney in this way. I, I you know those are my roots, and I'm not going to turn my back on the, and I'm not, not going to reinvent the roots either, okay? So yes, I, I felt uh, when I went up to see uh, uh, Hardwick for the interview, uh, uh, I remember that she had t the television on, and she was watching the tennis matches, and so she would watch the tennis matches with one eye, and she would answer my questions mm -hmm. with the other eye. So I didn't, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So I, I, I didn't feel a great deal of, of warmth and hospitality, you know, in, in that encounter, and I was never able to break through that she was very helpful uh, at the time. She asked me a lot of questions, but I just knew that there was a class thing, you know, uh, that was just was just in the way, and I and I and I felt it. So there was Lowell Yates, as I say, I would have felt something uh, something of the same. Hopkins, I don't, I don't know, as, as maybe because you know he worked in Liverpool, you know what I mean? He labored among the poor, the Irish poor in, in Liverpool, and then in Dublin, it would have been much more accessible. I mean, I can see that in the way that he. Uh, worked with the uh, Irish Jesuit brothers, you know, uh, I, I can see a warmth there and, and, and a real respect. So there would have been a chance for, you know, for me. Uh, with Williams, as they say, is it, you know, uh, as a doctor with, with, with very many strands, you know, uh, his mother was Puerto Rican and Jewish, uh, his father was a British citizen, um, but I, I could, I just, and I, and, and I knew the sons very well, I got, to, you know, interviewing them, and I, I could feel a real warmth there, okay? Um, so Lowell was, I think, the uh, Berryman I loved. I mean, Berryman was so crazy, you know what I mean, that uh, you know, I could have had a, a bottle of scotch with him, you know. Um, Hart, Crane, Hart Crane, I also felt I could have, I could have been a real, you know, he could have been a friend. Um, but, not, but not Lowell. And it's funny, I remember after I finished the biography of Lowell that I had a dream in which Lowell was uh, sitting at a table in a, in a restaurant and uh, I remember Randall Jarrell was there and Rethke and others, you know, uh, Sylvia Plath and Ann Sexton, and he said, hey, Mariana, he did a good job, you know. <laughs> so for whatever it's worth, it, it, it relieved me of a, lot of, of, a, of a lot of pressure. You know, there was a smile on his face like, okay, kid, you know, uh, sort of like with the Gambinos or something like that. <laughs> Come on over, you know, you're all right. Um, but with Bill Williams, it was much stronger. I, mean, I felt a real uh, uh, tug. But... Um, I don't know that I could really do a life of someone that I felt an antip antipathetic to. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, you spent too many of your years, and those years are draining away, and you're not going to ever get them again. They're gone. You know, I'm 69 now. I'm not, I can't get those years back. So why not at least enjoy it? Stevens, I'm, doing, I'm thinking of doing Stevens. I like Stevens. The, 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 there's a guy, for example, who took on Hemingway, uh, you know, when he was 60 years old. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> in, literally. <laughs> in I mean, in a fight. fight. <laughs> you know, in the down in Key West. I mean, he's 60 years old, and he, he's drunk, and he, has a, and he has a fight with 40-year-old Hemingway, who's been taking on the stevedores down on the, you know, and just does a job on him. 
You know, and, and then Stephen says, please don't ever tell anybody about this because I have a job back in Hartford. I'm, a, I'm an insurance executive, you know, back there. So he says, I promise I won't ever tell anybody. And then he writes a letter and says, I'm not, at, I can't, I'm not at liberty to mention names, but there was an insurance executive uh, <laughs> from Hartford who was a poet. Uh, <laughs> and I blackened both of his eyes, you know. <laughs> So I, I don't know, just having come from, you know, it, it's, it's a class thing. I, I, I'm aware of that, Richard. Mm. Um, and and I, I feel like Bobby Burns in that way. You know, I mean, there's the Scotch side, you know, and then the English, you know, you do the English stuff. Or Seamus Heaney, I feel a great kinship with Heaney in the same, in the same way. I, 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 those are my roots. I don't want to forget those roots, but I also don't want to live there forever either. You know, I want to move on into other, other spheres. So the biographies of those like you were easier to write than Lowell or to write about Yeats? Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. With, yeah, with Lowell, as I look, look back, uh, you know, the thing that, you know, it leveled the playing field for me with Lowell was the fact that he, he was, he suffered, uh, he had bipolar, you know, he was manic depressive. So that, uh, and when he was down, I mean, when he was manic, <coughs> Uh, he reminded me much more of myself <laughs> in the sense that uh, there was a weakness there. When I could find the Achilles heel, I could work, I could work with that. Uh, and for the most part, you know, he, uh, he was a very human being. I think, you know, he had his own troubles with his own parents. You know, he found out, you know, as he got older that his mother never wanted him. He was the only kid in the family, and she never wanted him. And she told him that. I mean, you know, what does that do to you? <laughs> um, it weans you. <laughs> it weans you. <laughs> no, no. But, but, it, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Very good. <laughs> Very quick. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> I, I, could, I, 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 I mentioned an absence from all our discussion, and it's Frost. I yeah, mean, yeah. Of, of your great poets, Frost is the one who imagines other people, mm. and it's not ventriloquism. He just is fascinated yeah. by this person being nothing, he listens wonderfully. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean he, he just listens to people, yeah. clearly. I think, I mean, a biography of him, I think, is a frightening <laughs> venture because of the number of ways in which he's extremely disagreeable. Yeah. He's not as disagreeable as Lawrence Thompson decided to make That's him out true, to absolutely. be, yeah. uh, you know, giving mm -hmm. us pale yeah. fire, giving right. us yeah. the biographer as the, per, as the kind of parasite mm. and parasite. Uh, <laughs> but but I, think, I think Frost yeah. is a very, very extraordinary, yeah. really extraordinary ability to take what we might think of as the world of fi the ability of, of yeah. the great novelist to do. Uh, to, to Absolutely. This. But the other yeah. the thing I could just mention, because uh, I know we're, we're mm -hmm. nearing an end, has the host guest conjunction formed as much part of your thinking as the, hos as the hostess hospitality enemy one? Because the host, mm -hmm. I mean, a host and guest are the same word, aren't they? And that, that's actually a different, at a different uh, angle on the host hospitality hostility question. Mm -hmm. I think George Herbert's uh, Love Bad Me Welcome is the greatest poem about uh, guest host mm. conjunction and of course about hostility and hospitality in that uh, in that the remonstrations that I'm not worthy are all hostile uh, I mean it's absolutely clear that their impulse is not uh, solely humility and modesty it's it's argu argument the caveats are all argumentative and kind of aggression uh, kind of aggressive mm. I mean I think it's an absolutely wonderful poem, and if I were to become a Christian again, it would be because of poems like that. Mm. Um, you don't know it by heart, do you, by any chance? N no, I know very little by heart. <laughs> and I know some one-line poems by heart. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the last line. I know the last, yeah, so I did this indeed. Mm. I mean, that's, that, that's hospitality, also run from hospitality. Yes, oh no, absolutely, no, it's, all, but it's, it's, all, it's, uh, it's extraordinary how much how much of the things that I gather you've been thinking about? I mean, somebody who both both is and is not a stranger to you. Mm. Somebody who is himself, of course, both three and one. I mean, that is, the Trinity, I take it, has to complicate all questions of otherness because you have this mm. extraordinary... I mean, the, it is other and is not other at all. Now, since I find that totally unbelievable and incomprehensible, I, w I would be Unitarian like the young Elliot. Um, though I, whether I would say I was brought up outside the Christian fold, I don't know, I do think that's a bit insulting. That's Unitarianism. Um, but, um. Is that strangeness of other and self, I mean, uh, g give me a gloss on the line from Little Getting Here, knowing myself 
yet being someone other. I mean, it's a very puzzling line. I was still the same, knowing myself, yet being someone other. Well, knowing myself <coughs> is partly an ancient injunction, mm -hmm. but it, it's also knowing that it was myself who was involved. I mean, knowing myself is partly a kind of a, a moral mm -hmm. and spiritual injunction, but it's also know, knowing myself, you know, this, mm -hmm. this is me all right, and so on. Uh, yet being someone other, because when you're in a dream that you're having and you're in it, you are really someone other. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that, I mean, aren't you repeatedly finding... I mean, if Freud is right that in dreams there are no contraries, mm -hmm. then it's built into it, that, that, that this, this, that the simultaneity of these paradoxes, isn't that right? That's why, you remember why Freud loves words that mean the opposites of themselves, mm -hmm. um, because they're like dreams, and you can <laughs> never tell. It's an axis, you can't tell what the direction is. Um, it's very, very, I mean, it's, mm. it's well, mm. but any final questions? Well, let's thank our guests. <laughs> I'm allowed to thank you.